Hello and welcome back everyone. This is the second part of the YOLO basic terminologies. And in this video, we're going to talk about the architecture or structure of YOLO. So on the YOLO basic terminologies uh, section, we have already talked about activation functions in the previous video. And in this video, uh, we would talk about the second point, uh, which is going to be the structure of YOLO. And we'll be looking at the backbone, neck, and head regions of the YOLO architecture. So the architecture of YOLO can be basically broken down into three different sections. The first one is the backbone. And the second one is called the neck. Uh, and the last part is going to, to be called head. And uh, last time we mentioned about one stage and two stage detectors. And when we talk about uh, these two detectors, uh, they basically may share some features on the backbone and neck. And they might be different on what uh, the type of prediction uh, that's going to be performed on the head section. So let's start by talking about the backbone. So a backbone is basically a word or a term used in YOLO literature in order to describe a convolutional neural network that accumulates and produces visual features with different shapes and sizes. So a backbone is basically a feature extractor and uh, any uh, deep neural network can act as a backbone. Uh, classification models like ResNet, VG, and EfficientNet are used as uh, feature extractors. And DarkNet, acts as a backbone for YOLO v2 and YOLO v3, uh, which we are going to talk about in detail in the next section. And CSPNet was introduced as a backbone in YOLO v4. So what do we mean by feature extraction? So feature extraction is a technique or an algorithm uh, that's basically extracting regions or features of interest uh, so that we can basically use uh, these features in order to, uh, to perform uh, some kind of detection or classification task. So it reduces a large input data into relative features. And the feature extraction algorithm can be uh, handcrafted in uh, earlier literatures and it can also be a deep convolutional neural network. So the first backbone that we're going to talk about is called Darknet. Uh, YOLO v2 introduced the Darknet 19, which is a 19 layer network supplemented with 11 more layers for object detection. And it has 19 convolutional layers and five max pooling layers. So it has 90 layers, uh, which are basically used for extracting features and 11 more layers were added in order to perform object detection. So when we combine both uh, the 90 layer network with the 11 layers, uh, we, we get a 30 layer architecture and YOLO v2 often struggled at detecting very small objects. Therefore, uh, the authors introduced successive uh, three by three and one by one convolutional layers, followed by some shortcut connections, allowing the network to be much deeper. So these uh, three by three and one by one convolutional layers uh, have been introduced by Google Net, and uh, they basically uh, tried many different types of convolutions and uh, joined them together so that uh, they can get uh, more information. 
out of the feature extraction process. And they also, but the three by three and one by one convolutional layers used in YOLO is performed sequentially. And there are some shortcut connections which are similar uh, to ResNet. And we have uh, Darknet 53, which is more powerful than Darknet 19. Uh, moreover, it is more efficient than ResNet 101 and ResNet 152. And the Darknet 53 uh, better utilizes the GPU, making it more efficient to evaluate and thus faster. Uh, that's explained by the observation that ResNets have too many layers and aren't very efficient. So basically, the the task of the YOLO literature was to find a more efficient, uh, computationally efficient network uh, that's going to better utilize the GPU or any computing environment. So in order to make the computation more efficient, they, they introduced an architecture known as Darknet on uh, YOLO v2. So uh, we will talk about how they better utilize and how they make the computation more efficient in later, uh, later videos. So when we look at the Darknet 19 and Darknet 53 uh, uh, backbones side by side, so uh, we can see that Darknet 53 is more deeper, much deeper than Darknet 19. And uh, there are a couple of layers in the middle on Darknet 53, uh, which are going to be performed uh, multiple times. So there are some uh, convolutions and residual layers on Darknet 53, uh, which are going to be performed repeatedly for one time on the first stage. And then we have two times, uh, then it kept well, we keep increasing by a factor of two, but we have here eight times, eight times, and then finally four times. And uh, this uh, architecture makes it more deeper. And in these blocks, these are called blocks, and then we perform uh, them multiple times, and the spatial dimension is preserved, which means we're not going to perform any strikes. And on the layers which are found next to the blocks, we use a stride of two after a three by three convolutions in order to reduce the spatial dimension. So uh, that's basically uh, what we need to know about uh, Darknet 19 and Darknet 53 at this stage. So another backbone that's mentioned on the YOLO literature is the cross-stage partial network. And CSPNet is actually uh, actually has its own paper, and it's more it's more of a more uh, computationally efficient component uh, that that can be implemented into different types of backbones, uh, so that it they can be deployed on CPUs and GPUs. So, as we know from uh, our previous experience in deep learning, ResNet, ResNext and DenseNet are very deep neural networks, and they need uh, higher-end GPUs in order, to, uh, in order to be trained and deployed. But in order to implement these kinds of networks on CPUs or on mobile phones, it's going to be much difficult. And in order to perform real-time object detection, uh, we cannot use uh, these types of backbones because they are not computationally efficient. So in order to make them more efficient without affecting the uh, inference speed and accuracy, the YOLO literature introduces the CSP uh, cross-stage partial network onto these backbones uh, so that they can better fit into these, kind of, these kinds of computing environments. So CSPNet allows richer gradient combination while reducing the amount of computation. So they reduce the amount of computation, and at the same time, they allow 
for the gradients that are computed uh, during the learning process to propagate more thoroughly and they allow for these gradients to be combined. And partitioning the feature map of the base layer into two parts and then merging them through a proposed cross-stage hierarchy. So uh, we will uh, take a look at this section particularly in detail on the next slide. But for now, uh, we just say that if, the, if we have a feature map which has been computed from a previous layer, then we, or from the input layer, uh, we can divide that feature map into two parts and then let them propagate in different directions in separate ways. And then after performing, uh, we can perform some sort of convolutions on the first part. And then on the second part, we just uh, concatenate or merge them together at the end. So that's basically the idea behind a cross-stage partial network. So this allows for gradient flow to propagate uh, through different network paths by splitting the gradient flow. It allows for a better gradient propagation. And the propagated gradient information can have a large correlation difference by switching the concatenation and transition steps, which is better than dense net. So there is a more correlation difference. So uh, let's take a look at the dense net and CSP net in detail. So on the dense net paper, what they uh, what they did was they just basically used uh, so if there is a feature map which which has been extracted, they they perform convolution uh, first on that feature map, and they just allow the feature map to propagate to the next stage, and then they merge or concatenate the outputs from the convolution operation together with the original input. And then we copy the second one and then we add and merge uh, the, the output from the second convolution. And then we repeat this process. And then finally, we are propagating the input feature uh, as we are performing more convolutions. So as you can see uh, from this diagram on at the bottom, we can perform multiple convolutions. And at the same time, we're allowing for the uh, input feature map to propagate through the network. So previously, uh, before DanceNet, the strategy was just performing convolutions. And then uh, at, the at the final stage, uh, we just perform uh, detection or classification. So they didn't allow for the input feature map to propagate uh, through the network. So ResNet actually uh, allowed some of the input to propagate through the network uh, uh, by using uh, connections. So, but they didn't concatenate, so they just added the, uh, the elements uh, from the previous layer to the next layer. And when they add the features from the input and the output uh, of the convolution operation, so those feature maps are being mixed and they're being uh, deeply correlated with one another. So we don't know uh, which feature is from the input layer and the, and uh, which one is from the output of the convolution layer. So that's one problem that the ResNet architecture had, and they solved this problem on the DenseNet architecture. So there there is clear separation of feature maps. We know which layer, uh, which feature maps belong to which layer. And there is no correlation between uh, different stages. So they're not uh, deeply correlated. And on CSPNet, 
So they basically allow for, they partitioned the input feature map into two. So we have two parts, as we can see from the diagram on the right. So they allowed the first part uh, to, to be transferred directly to the transition layer. But on the second part, on the second partition, they just basically uh, performed the same type of operation as they did on DenseNet. So on the second partition, they performed a bunch of convolutions and concatenated them together. And they allowed the second partition of the input feature map to uh, directly move to the transition layer and is being concatenated. So the advantages of the CSPNet architecture are strengthening the learning ability. So lightweight versions of ResNet, ResNext, and DenseNet have suboptimal performance, which means when we uh, try to reduce the number of layers for uh, deeper architectures, they will give us suboptimal performance. So their accuracy will, uh, will drop down. So after applying the CSPNet concept on these backbones, the computation effort can be reduced from 10% to 20%, but outperforms the original backbones. So what CSPNet does was improving the computational effort so, so that these uh, architectures can be deployed on, on uh, mobile phones or uh, CPUs and uh, cloud GPUs. So they reduce the computational effort and at the same time, their performance was uh, similar or very close to the original deep, uh, deep neural networks. So on one of the, uh, the second advantage of uh, the CSPNet was removing the computational bottleneck. It evenly distributes the amount of computation at each layer in the CNN. So there is no bottleneck from when we move from one layer to another layer. And the third advantage is reducing memory cost by adopting a cross-channel pooling to compress the feature maps during the feature pyramid generation process. So uh, we, we're not using a lot of memory in order to compute, uh, in order to perform some of these convolutions. And uh, we're not going to look at the cross-channel pooling in detail on this section, but we can just say that one of the advantages of CSPNet is reducing the memory cost. So in CSP ResNex 50 and CSP Darknet 53, the dense net has been edited to separate the feature map of the base layer by copying it and sending one copy through the dense block and sending another straight, straight on to the next stage. So this is basically what we have seen on the previous slide. So this kind of method was deployed on the ResNex 50 and Darknet 53 backbones. And uh, CSP can be deployed on basically any type of backbones, just a concept. So the idea uh, with uh, CSP ResNex 50 and CSP Darknet 53 is to remove the computational bottlenecks in the dense in the dense net and improve learning by passing on the unedited version of the feature map. So uh, when we allow some of the feature, uh, when we allow some of the features to propagate directly through the network without performing any kind of uh, convolution, we are preserving some of the essential uh, spatial information uh, from that layer and it improves the learning process and it also reduces the computational effort. So concatenation is actually much more computationally efficient than just uh, performing a bunch of convolutions. And we just uh, aggregate and concatenate the layers 
uh, using a constant rate when we use dense net and CSP net. But when we use a normal convolution, uh, the rate the rate at which the network uh, in we, on which the ch number of channels for a specific layer grows is much more uh, higher compared to uh, dense net and CSP net. So that's why we don't use uh, normal backbones like ResNext, ResNext, ResNext and Darknet directly as a backbone uh, for YOLO. So we have uh, finished talking about the backbone and the next component is the neck. And as we can see from the name, uh, when we talk about the neck, it's just basically a, a connection between the backbone and the head of the network. And the purpose of uh, this layer is just to integrate and blend the characteristics before passing them to the prediction layer. And it basically collects uh, feature maps from different stages of the backbone. So uh, our backbone is going to perform a bunch of convolutions. And when we perform convolutions, the spatial dimension or the resolution of the image is going to be reduced. And as we go deeper in our network, the spatial dimension will be reduced, but the information or the complexity of the features which are, uh, which are learned by the network are going to increase as we go deeper inside the network. So on other terms, it's called a feature aggregator. And we're basically going to combine the semantic information that is propagated uh, inside the network from different layers uh, using the NIC. And there are several examples of, uh, of how the NIC can be deployed. Uh, these are the feature pyramid network. The second is the path aggregation network. And finally, we have a by FPN. So before we talk about feature pyramid networks, uh, let's try to see image and feature pyramids. So before the invention of feature pyramid networks, uh, what we had was a pyramid of images. So we start with an original image and we reduce the resolution of the image by a constant rate. And then we just perform prediction on the uh, different resolutions of the same image. So when we perform predictions on different scales of the same image, it can be time consuming and the memory demand will be too high uh, to be trained end to end simultaneously. Another option was instead of using the images, uh, why can't we use the feature pyramids? Uh, Pyramid of images and pyramid of feature maps are different. On the first case, we're just using uh, different resolutions of the image. But on the second case, we're computing, uh, we're performing some kind of convolution on that image and we're creating a feature map, which is different from the original image. And the dimension or the spatial resolution is going to be reduced at the same time. And then once we perform uh, a bunch of convolutions, we can predict on uh, different layers. And uh, this basically gives us some kind of performance improvement when compared to the pyramid of images. So the reason why we do this is like, we want to detect objects of different sizes uh, from different resolutions of the same image. So smaller objects can be detected on the shadow part of the network, or we can detect them on the, on the first or the second layer. And on the last, as we go deeper, uh, we can detect larger objects. So you can imagine if you want to perform object detection on this kind of method, if you use uh, the sliding window approach, 
uh, if we use a five by five sliding window, we can detect, uh, we can fit very small um, objects on the first layer, but as we go deeper, that, uh, that same five by five sliding window uh, will be able to uh, fit larger objects. So larger objects can be detected on the deeper uh, layer of the network and smaller objects can be detected on the shallow part of the network. So alternatively, we these uh, future pyramids can be used instead of the images. So instead of performing the sliding window approach on the image, we're just going to perform on the feature maps and we try to uh, detect objects from those feature maps. So once we understand the concepts of image pyramids and feature, feature pyramids, a feature pyramid network is an addition to the feature pyramids and it's basically a feature extractor designed for such pyramid concepts with accuracy and speed in mind. So it replaces the feature extractor of detectors like faster RCNN and generates multiple feature map layers, multi-scale feature maps with better quality information than the regular feature uh, pyramid for object detection. So it naturally leverages the py uh, pyramidal shape of a confidence feature hierarchy while creating a feature pyramid that has strong semantics at all scales. So these are just a, a bunch of words, so I will try to explain by using uh, a diagram. So a feature pyramid network is uh, composed of two components. So we have a bottom-up pathway and a top-down pathway. So the new architecture of the feature pyramid network is combining semantically strong features with semantically weak features via a top-down pathway and lateral connections. So predictions can be made independently at all levels. So one problem that we might encounter just by using a feature pyramid is the semantic information will be lost. So if we just perform predictions on the top part, uh, we're just losing the weak semantic information, uh, which is being held by the shallower part of the network and we want the informations to to be uh, to be correlated so for example we can learn uh, some information from the weak semantic uh, information that comes from the shallow part of the network and we can perform predictions on those uh, different layers so the FPN has three components. First is the bottom-up pathway, uh, second is the top-down pathway, and the third is the lateral connections in between. So let's talk about the bottom-up pathway first. So the bottom-up pathway is just basically the same as the feature pyramids that we talked about before. So it just uses a convolutional networks for feature extraction. As we go up, the spatial resolution will decrease and high level structures uh, will be detected and the semantic value for each layer increases. So as we go uh, up, the semantic information will increase and the resolution will decrease when we go down, as we can see from the image. So bottom up, uh, only a bottom-up uh, pathway was used in the SSD network, a single shot detector. So SSD makes a detection from multiple feature maps. However, the bottom layers are not selected for object detection. So on the feature pyramid, we're just performing, we were performing predictions on all of the layers, but for SSD, we're just performing uh, predictions on the top, top, topmost part of the network. 
and we're not considering the shallow part of the network. So they are in high resolution, those that are in high resolution, but the semantic value is very low and not high enough. So we, they just, the authors of this paper, they just assumed uh, the speed slowdown is significant when we consider uh, the lower, the shallower part of the network. So we can just uh, leave them behind and then perform predictions only on the the layers that have higher semantic value. So when SSD uses the upper layers for detection, it performs much worse for smaller objects. Because as I mentioned before, if we want to detect large objects, we have to use uh, deeper layers. And since they basically uh, removed or did not consider the shallow part of the network, those are the ones that are really good for detecting smaller objects. So the network was performing very poorly when detecting small objects, but it's performing uh, good, good enough when detecting larger objects. The second part of the feature pyramid network is the top-down pathway. And to, to construct a higher resolution layers from a semantically rich layer. So first we went up and then we tried to go, uh, we tried to go down. And when we uh, go down, we perform the predictions not on the original feature maps, but on these new uh, feature maps. And we're going to increase the spatial uh, resolution as we go down. So the third, the third component is the lateral connection between the bottom-up pathway and the top-down pathway. So while the reconstructed layers are semantically strong, but the locations of objects are not precise, after all, the downsampling and upsampling. So they can be semantically strong, but they are not precise enough uh, when we perform upsampling by using uh, deconvolution. So the lateral connections, their purpose is just to add the semantic information that comes from the previous layer and add it to the one from uh, from the last layer. So for example, for the last layer, uh, we, we use that last layer and then we perform some kind of uh, deconvolution in order to increase the spatial size. And we add the semantic information from the preceding layer or uh, concatenate uh, depending upon what we're doing. And after the summation, the, the feature maps are going to be correlated and we have a, the corresponding feature maps with different semantic information uh, propagating through the network. So that helps to make the, the prediction of the network uh, to be much more better. And it also acts as a skip connection uh, to make the training easier, uh, such as ResNet. So these lateral connections are the same as the skip connections in the ResNet network. So now uh, we have seen the bottom-up pathway and we have seen the top-down pathway and we also have seen the lateral connections. Now we can see the complete picture by combining all of these components. So the bottom-up pathway, we can use the ResNet to construct the bottom-up pathway on the original feature pyramid network paper. They use uh, ResNet. And when we perform the convolutions, like for example, we can, uh, we can perform five convolution in this case. So, we can uh, write all the convolutions as conv i, where i equals to one to five. 
and each has many convolutional layers. As we move up, the spatial dimension is reduced by half and by doubling the stride. So when we go up, which is the bottom up pathway, uh, we're going to uh, reduce the spatial dimension by half by using a stride of two. And the output of each convolution module is labeled as CI, such as uh, C1, C2, C3, C4, up to C5. And it's going to be used later in the top-down pathway by using the lateral connection. So we're going to apply a one-by-one -one convolutional filter to reduce the C5 channel, uh, which is the last layer from the bottom-up pathway. And with a channel depth of 256, so the number of channels for the last layer will be 256, to create the feature map M5, which is going to be the first layer of the top-down pathway, which is going to be used for object prediction. Uh, it's going to be basically the first uh, object prediction. And as we go down the top-down path, we upsample the previous layer by two. Uh, we're going to increase the spatial dimension by two using uh, nearest neighbor upsampling or any kind of upsampling operation. And we again apply a one-by-one -one convolution to the corresponding feature maps in the bottom-up pathway. Then we add them element-wise. So when we go down, so we reduce the spatial dimension by two. Uh, I mean, we increase. Uh, when we go from bottom-up, we reduce the spatial dimension. But when we go top down, we increase the spatial dimension by using upsampling. And we again apply a one by one convolution to the corresponding feature map on the bottom up pathway, which is C4, and we add them element wise. So M5 and C4, after applying a one by one convolution, are going to be added element wise and we apply a 3x3 three three convolution to all the merged layers. So on M4, we're going to apply a 3x3 three three convolution. So the reason that why we use the 3x3 three three convolution is because uh, we want aliasing effect when merging with the upsampled layer. So when we perform a nearest neighbor, there is going to be some kind of aliasing effect and we're not going to go deeper on this uh, part. If you want to understand about upsampling and nearest neighbor and aliasing, you can uh, you can use other resources in order to know more about them. So the one by one convolutions are necessary because uh, we want a fixed uh, number of channels. So we used 256, and in order to add them element wise. Uh, with the feature maps coming from the bottom-up pathway, the number of channels must be the same so that we can perform uh, matrix addition. So once one, the one-by-one one convolution takes care of the number of channels, and the three-by-three three convolutions which are performed on the feature maps on the top-down pathway in order to generate a P5, P4, P3, and P2, are necessary because they remove some of the aliasing effects that comes from the upsampling. So we repeat the same process for P3 and P2 as we go down. And we stop at P2 and we do not go to C1 because the spatial dimension of C1 is very large and it will slow down the process too much. So we just don't want to include the conv1 feature map and because we share the same classifier and bounding box regressor for every output, so for starting from P5 up to P2, 
uh, we're going to use the same classifier and bounding, bounding box regressor. So we want the shape of all of these feature maps to be the same, which is 256. So that's why we performed and reshaped uh, all of the feature maps to 256. So that's basically it about feature pyramid networks. FPN is not an object detector by itself. It is a feature extractor that works with object detectors. So it serves as a neck to the backbone. So FPN is actually independent to the backbone. So we can implement FPN for any kind of backbone. It's just basically an idea and it can be deployed uh, on any type of backbone and it can be used for tasks such as a region proposal network, object detector, or instance segmentation. The second type of uh, network that we're going to look at on, that serves as a neck for the YOLO architecture is PANNET, which stands for Path Aggregation Network. And it, it was originally deployed on the neck of YOLO v4. And the path aggregation network was actually used, it was chosen for instant segmentation. And it has its own paper. And they deployed, they made a slight modification to the original PANnet and deployed it on uh, YOLO v4. And it can be incorporated into the model to enhance the process of instant segment, segmentation by preserving the spatial information. So path aggregation network basically adds an extra layer uh, so that the spatial information can be preserved. So the reason why PANNET is chosen for instant segmentation is because of the preservation of the spatial information, which uh, accurately helps in proper localization of pixels for, max, for, uh, for mask formation. So if we want to localize the pixels, instead of just drawing a bounding box, if we want to properly label all of the pixels for an object, we want a more sophisticated network than just using the feature pyramid network. So the path aggregation network also have the components of the feature pyramid network. So as the image passes through the various layers of the neural network, the complexity of the features increases and the spatial resolution of the image decreases concurrently. So as we have seen before, uh, on the bottom-up pathway, the complexity of the features increases and the resolution of the image decreases. And due to Due to this, the pixel level masks cannot be identified accurately by the high level features. So these masks are going to be very difficult to, rec to be recognized as we go up because the spatial resolution is very, very small. And the FPN, which is used in YOLO v3, uses a top-down path. So besides the bottom-up path, in YOLO v3, we had the top-down path of the feature pyramid network. And the top-down path was used together with the lateral connections in order to combine uh, semantically rich features with precise localization information so that we can combine the semantic information from different layers uh, in order to improve the prediction. But for producing masks for large objects, this technique can be excessively lengthy and the spatial information may need to be propagated to hundreds of layers. So if we want to detect larger objects, the, the deeper the network, the, the more excessive or it's gonna take a long amount of time in order to detect those objects because it, in order for those objects to be detected, 
uh, we our network has to be deep and they're going to be detected on basically on on the top part of the bottom up pathway so it's going to take a lot of time uh, for them to be detected so that's not feasible so the path ag aggregation network on the other hand takes an additional bottom up path to the top down path of the feature pyramid network so we have a bottom-up, then a top-down, and then we add an additional bottom-up. And then we add, uh, we also have clean lateral connection from the lower layers to the top ones. So we also introduce some additional uh, lateral connections uh, from the lower layers to the top ones. So this is called a shortcut connection, and uh, which is only about uh, 10 layers, and it's not uh, that sophisticated. So why did we add an extra uh, bottom-up path? So the previously used techniques like Mascar CNN used features from a single stage to make mask predictions. So they just, uh, on Mascar CNN, they basically used a uh, single stage uh, feature map in order to perform uh, mask predictions. And they used uh, a technique called ROI align pulley. So you don't need to be concerned about this term because we're going to, uh, I'm going to make a video in detail about uh, ROIs uh, when we talk about uh, two stage detectors. So ROI line pooling is just basically used to extract features from higher levels if the region of interest was large. So if, if the region of interest was large, we use ROI pooling. Uh, we perform this operation. It, it's a pooling operation. And then we just uh, select some of the values. And we, we use those values in order to create a feature map uh, in order to create a region of interest. And when we want to detect larger objects, we use the layers uh, which are found above. So although quite accurate, this could still lead to undesired results as sometimes two proposals with as many as uh, 10 pixel differences can be assigned to different layers, whereas uh, they are in fact quite similar proposals. So even if this kind of operation is accurate, if we have two proposals which only have 10 pixel differences, they can be assigned to two different layers, even though that these two proposals are quite similar. So we're just performing redundant operation for something that's very close and that's not needed. So to avoid uh, this, the PanNet uses features from all the layers and lets the network decide which ones are useful. So instead of just performing the ROI align operation on the last layer, on the last feature map, it performs the ROI align operation on each feature map of the, of the third component of our uh, path aggregation network, which is the bottom-up pathway. And we perform uh, this uh, ROI line of operation on each of the feature maps instead of just the top one. And this is followed by an element-wise max fusion operation and enable the network to adapt new features. So once we perform the ROI line operation, uh, we, we use an element-wise uh, fusion operation in order to merge uh, sometimes we can add the values from all of these feature maps, or sometimes we can just concatenate. So, uh, so the fusion process uh, can be different. Uh, on the original one, uh, we'll see on the later slide, uh, we'll be using an addition. And uh, on YOLO, they modified the original 
uh, pan in order to make it they just use concatenation instead of uh, addition so what's fully connected fusion so one once we use the ROI line operation in order to extract the feature maps from different layers in uh, mask or CNN the fully convolutional network was used instead of fully connected layers because it preserves the spatial information and reduces the number of parameters used in the network. So in Mascar CNN, they just basically used uh, fully convolutional networks without using fully connected layers because they believed that it's going to preserve the spatial information. And if you, if you remember from uh, some of the courses in deep learning, if you use fully connected layers, the number of parameters inside your network will increase. So if you remove those fully connected layers and replace them by uh, convolutional networks, the number of parameters can be reduced significantly. So however, since the parameters are shared for the spatial positions, the model doesn't actually learn how to use the pixel locations for making predictions. Because you're using uh, a fully convolutional network, all of the spatial positions are shared across the, the parameters will be shared for those spatial positions. So the model is not going to learn actually, uh, the model is not going to learn anything new because they are dependent upon the pixel locations in order to make those predictions. So for example, let's say if, if you have an image containing a sky and roads. So if you just use a fully convolutional neural network, so those spatial informations about the sky and the road are going to be preserved uh, for the entire length of the network because we didn't use any fully connected uh, layers. And our network is not actually learning anything new in order to perform segmentation or detection operation. So another path is just to use fully connected layers. And if we just deploy fully connected layers, they are uh, location sensitive and can adapt to different spatial locations. So for example, those spatial locations might be changed uh, when we perform uh, some operation uh, when we perform some kind of operation on the feature maps but the fully connected layers can learn more specifically uh, where those objects are located inside the image and they do not depend upon the spatial locations so a pan net uses information from the fully connected uh, layers and also the fully convolutional neural networks. So we have seen before, Mascar CNN only uses a fully connected network. But now, as we can see from the image, they branched out and then they used a fully co connected layer and reshaped that to be two-dimensional again. And then they added them together in order to find the mask. So Panit uses both uh, a fully connected fusion. So we, we get the ROI proposals from the different layers uh, of the, the bottom-up path, the last bottom-up path. And then we perform a, a three convolutions. And then uh, on the first path, we're going to perform con4 deconvolution and we're just going to preserve the spatial dimensions. And on the other path, we're going to change it into a fully connected layer so that it can learn better and so that it could be sensitive to the location. And then we just fuse the outputs from uh, Bo's uh, path. So, YOLO v4 uses the path aggregation network, but they just made a slight modification to the way in which we merge the different layers. So PanNet 
conventionally adds the neighboring layers. So we just perform an additional operation for doing mask predictions using adaptive feature pooling. And we have already looked at what adaptive feature pooling means. And however, this approach is slightly changed when PANET is employed in YOLO v4 because we used a concatenation operation instead of the addition operation in order to combine uh, all those layers. And when it's applied, they actually improved the accuracy for the prediction. And that's why they used a concatenation operation. Because uh, as you remember, when we look at ResNet, we just use element-wise addition. And when you, whenever you use addition, you're going to combine all of those features. They're going to be added. They're going to be merged. They're going to be more correlated. So it's very hard to separate uh, the different layers. We don't even know which of the parameters are coming from which layer. But if we use concatenation, uh, we're going to preserve that spatial information coming from the different layers. And that's why it's preferred. So finally, we have the head of the network. So once we uh, finish everything with the neck, we take the, the features from the neck and then we perform predictions. Uh, predictions for the classes and predictions for the bounding boxes. So the head, of, the head part of the YOLO v4 architecture just performs classification along with regression. So we have two stage detectors and one stage detectors, uh, which are performed on the head part of the network. And it basically finds the region where the object might be present. So this is all about this video and uh, thank you.